My topic tonight is objective moral values. When I was in my teens, I suppose I believed that they existed. Uh, at any rate, I read a book. I believe it was this book, but I'm not sure. And the villain in the book said, laws are simply the prejudices of the majority. Something to that effect. And that shocked me. I thought, no, laws are an expression of what is truly right or wrong. And the idea here is that are these things right or wrong regardless of what that we think? Are they truly right or wrong? Or are they simply the prejudices of the majority? Most people feel these are right or wrong, and so they are. If most people felt that eating ice cream was wrong, but that stealing was right, then they would be. That's the second view here. So this can be phrased in terms of subjective and objective. Objective moral values, something that is objective is like a person's height. Something is subjective is like how you feel about something. And the idea is that objective moral values means that something is truly right or wrong, no matter what we think of it. And the idea here is some people use objective, the existence of what they believe to be objective moral values to prove that God exists. And here's the argument. It's called the moral argument for the existence of God. God does not exist, then objective moral values and duties do not exist because there's no one to ordain them to make them objectively true. We're just left to figure it out on our own, whatever we feel. But the argument goes objective moral values do exist, therefore God must exist. So God is ordaining what is objectively right and objectively wrong. That's the argument. Uh, many people make this argument. One, pe one person, I've mentioned this person's website before. His name is William Wayne Craig. He's a rather famous Christian apologist. Uh, apologist being someone who tries to make the truths of the Christian faith believable and defend them against criticism. Now, in a previous uh, episode, Gatekeeper of the Mind Space, I mentioned logical fallacies. So I'm going to point out a few possible logical fallacies in this. Uh, discussion tonight as we go. And the first one I want to mention is the straw man. Now the idea there is that either rightly or wrong, uh, either intentionally or unintentionally, maybe I didn't make the argument for objective moral values as accurately or as strongly as it could be made. And the idea here is that sometimes a person will state an opponent's argument, but state it in a weak or misleading way so the argument is easy to refute. If you're interested, you can search for objective moral values and read or watch as many presentations as you like. I think I've made a fair representation of it, but uh, uh, I could be accused of doing a straw, of creating a straw man. Now, another thing is that someone might say, well, people who believe in objective moral values just want an external authority figure. They're like children on a playground who can't decide among themselves what's right or wrong. So they go to a teacher or a parent and they ask the parent. And this would be the generic fallacy. In other words, even if what I just said was absolutely true and no one argued with it about the children, that would in no way impact whether the moral argument for God is true or not. Where the argument came from and whether it's true or not are two separate things. So the argument, the moral argument for God is sometimes presented this way. Laws demand a lawgiver. So if objective moral values or objective moral laws exist, then there must be a lawgiver. Now here is yet another illogical fallacy. I'm going crazy with logical fallacies tonight, uh, but I think it's worthwhile. This is the fallacy of ambiguity, also called equivocation. The idea is law is being used in two ways. We have the law of gravity, and then we have a law enacted by some government. Now, a law enacted by some government needs people, legislators, to enact that law. But it's possible that the law of gravity exists, and there's no God who is a person who created the universe who enacted the law of gravity. So there's an equivocation going when people say laws need a lawgiver. Laws created by human beings need a lawgiver, but 
laws like the law of gravity do not necessarily need a God who is a person outside of the universe. And besides, just as in a little aside, in this episode I argued that we don't know that there are laws, that inductive reasoning can never give you absolute certainty, but that's kind of an aside point. So where are we? Well, we want to know whether these things over here are objectively wrong or simply the prejudices of the minority, majority. Sorry. That brings me to yet another logical fallacy called black or white are the false dichotomy because there's another choice and that would be not that God says so, which is the, 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 the argument of objective moral values, but things could be objectively moral because the nature of the universe says so. Now, this might present a problem because this seems to say, well, what tells us the nature of the universe? Science does. And science tells us how the world is, but it's you often acknowledge that science can't tell us how the world ought to be. It doesn't involve itself in values, in what we should value. It just tells us the way the world is. And so this thought has been, it's famous in philosophy as Hume's guillotine, that you can't get from an is to an ought. So science could tell us the way the world is, but we're not going to be able to extract moral values from science. And I, I talked about this uh, in that episode. Now, that is absolutely true. But if we add an ingredient, if we add values, then is and values can give you an ought. And a very simple example is science is like a map. And if I'm going to travel from one city to another, science gives me the map and I see many roads. But if I decide I value taking a leisurely scenic trip, then it might be obvious which road to take. If I value getting to that other city as quickly as possible, I'll take the, uh, the, hot, the highway or the turnpike. So the idea is, is once we have values and we know the nature of the world, we can get oughts. Now, what should we value? Well, a very old answer to that question is Aristotle who said we should value human flourishing. And there's the Greek word for it. That's a very old answer. I don't know if the human flourishing communicates much to us, that, that, that phrase nowadays, but here's something that's a little bit more, I think, understandable. The greatest good to the greatest number of people. That's a value. Of course, uh, there's still some discussion, could be discussion about what is the greatest good, but there's discussions about what scriptures mean. So we're no worse off by accepting this. Now, so for instance, why is killing wrong? Well, let's suppose there was no law against killing. So someone kills someone else, and then perhaps members, uh, family members of the killed person try to take revenge. And you get what's called a blood feud. And this is a famous blood feud in the United States, the Hatfield and McCoys, where one family tries, is at war, basically, with another family. I read an account once, I believe, I believe that this has something to do with the Dead Sea Scrolls, that one of the people who found them was involved in a blood feud. I'm not positive. But what I remember reading was that some man in Egypt 150 years ago was on his way to kill a person, not any particular person, just a person of a rival family or tribe because the two families were having a blood feud. So if you don't have laws against killing, you get that, and eventually you get that. And so it's obvious that if you want a stable society, you should outlaw killing and have laws against it. So we have two choices here. I believe that objective moral values can be accounted for by the nature of the universe along with the value of the greatest good for the greatest number of people, and that no external God who is a person who ordains right or wrong is necessary. But certainly, if there was a God ordaining right or wrong, that would also account for objective moral values. So which one of these two alternatives is true? Well, I believe that the first one is false, and 
what I'm going to do is a proof by contradiction. So um, a proof by contradiction, I'm going fast. You can stop and read any of these things. Uh, I don't want to take the time to point out every detail. But here is my proof by contradiction. I have to make an added stipulation that God is good. Most people, I think, would agree with that if they believe in God. So let's suppose objective moral values exist. Therefore, God exists. And let's suppose God is good. Well, then I believe that God would certainly have informed us what is objectively moral and what is not. And we would have been informed millennia ago. But I claim that God has not informed us what is objectively good and uh, objectively moral and not objectively moral. Now, if you accept this premise, which I'll argue for in a bit, or this conclusion, then that means one of these three things must be false or more. And I claim what is false is that we can't prove that God exists. Uh, I can accept that things are objectively moral in the second sense, the nature of the universe and the value of the greatest good for the greatest number of people. So I do not believe that the moral argument proves the existence of a transcendental personal God. Now let me, but I have to substantiate this. And this is rather easy. Slavery and genocide. For centuries. Now I'm talking in, in the Christian context. I believe this argument could be made for other religions, but I don't know enough about other religions. So I have to confine myself to the Christian context. For centuries, Christians burnt women to death that they believed were witches. Now I, I think we would accept today that that was morally wrong. Why weren't they told it was morally wrong? Suppose that we have a God. I hope you agree that this is morally wrong. Yet, Christians were not informed of that fact. After a few centuries of doing it, they thought, well, maybe it's wrong. Similarly, for centuries, slavery was practiced, particularly in the southern states of the United States of America. A very Christian part of the country, even today. Slavery was practiced for centuries. If slavery is morally wrong, why didn't God tell them? The argument could be made that this is in the Bible, but then for 200 years, people didn't know that, or 300 years. It's certainly not in the Bible explicitly. Christians for centuries believed that this was morally right. Here's something in the Bible. The Lord God said, go strike the uh, um, Amalek and destroy everything they have. Do not spare man, woman, child, infant, ox, sheep, camel, or donkey. So I believe that humanity has tried, has had to grope and find what is moral on its own. Slavery was only outlawed in the United States after a horrible war that killed hundreds of thousands of people. It would have been nice if God exists uh, as the transcendental person and if moral, objective moral values exist, it would have saved a lot of lives if God had led us on to the fact that slavery is not moral. But that didn't happen. So I believe that the moral argument for a transcendental, transcendent personal God fails. I believe that we're on our own, but that doesn't mean that what is moral is just up to the whims of the populace. I believe that if we understand the nature of the universe and we accept the value of the greatest good for the greatest number, that a lot of things can be determined to be objectively moral. Anyway, that's my opinion, and thank you for listening.